And today I want to talk about um, some old work and actually several new projects um, about integrators and short and long term memory. And first of all, about integrators. So, so integration, as in, in the sense of calculus, is a fundamental computation um, in neurobiology and neural systems and in many different tasks and brain regions. So what I'm showing here is one of the most classic places we um, know of integration. It's path integration in the concept of a velocity to position integration and sort of the superstar of this world, although this is done across many species, including humans, um, are desert ants. So what a desert ant can do is leave its nest and go out foraging for food. And you see it can take a very circuitous path here. And we think that it's actually integrating its footsteps from, very, from a lot of beautiful experiments from Rudiger Vayner's lab and others. Because when it gets to the food, it can come and it can take a bee line or an ant line straight back to its nest as if it knows you know, the distance it's traveled and the direction in both the X and Y directions. So then that integration is again is velocity to position, and it's one I'll talk about today in a different in a different setting. Another classic one that many of you I'm sure know about in the computational neuroscience community is decision making and the accumulation of evidence in particular for decision making. And the classic task done by, by you know, people like uh, you know, Newsom and Shadlin and others is a two alternative decision. And the question would be here, is the average motion up or down of the dots? And here I'm just highlighting that the coherence overall is determined by a certain number that are directed in the, in the preferred direction. They're highlighted in white, and the other ones are moving in a random direction. And the reason there needs to be an integration here is because, the, because there's a random component of the motion which must be averaged over so that the systematic mean motion um, you know, eventually outweighs, outcounts, outintegrates the random motion. And in fact, there's even individual neurons that are found in the neocortex that show this integration. So that's being shown here from a review from Golden Shadlin. Uh, this is integrated evidence for up or down. This was an up trial. And you can see the mean um, drift rate. Um, it could be of the evidence here, but it actually is even seen in single neurons. This is just showing for the evidence goes up until some bound is reached, at which point the animal says, I have sufficient uh, you know, confidence to answer that I think the motion is upwards. So I'm going to talk about a different task where uh, we really think we're starting to get an understanding of the circuitry. And the big you know, question in these more cognitive circuits is, you know, how does this work? Well, in the oculomotor system, I'm, go I'm going to show you that we think we're getting at how a circuit can actually compute an integral and actually get down to the level of the microcircuitry. And some of this will be old work from uh, my uh, former postdoc, Dimitri Fisher, and some new work from uh, my uh, current postdoc, Alex Sood. So the big question for today is what circuit architectures or motifs generate such persistent activity? So first, I want to start you with the standard model of, um, of how integrator and integrators are formed and how persistent activity is maintained. In particular, I'm going to be talking about analog persistent activity here. And you, know, you can look up papers from myself and others on the less standard ways, but today I'm going to stick with the standard traditional model. So the main story is that uh, you know, most neurons in isolation are leaky. They do not integrate inputs. If a brief temp you know, temporally precise command comes into this neuron, its firing rate will come up and come down with some biophysical um, time scale. But we know neurons aren't in isolation. They're connected to other neurons, both through, and they have both mutual excitatory paths. So this is representing really a neural population or mutual inhibition between competing populations. And with that, the story is that the, this population can be excited. And then in, after the offset of the command input, the population can continue to maintain its activity through its own self-excitation or through inhibiting those neurons that were inhibiting it. And with this, it, if everything is tuned correctly, and I'm not gonna talk so much about that today, but you can ask me in the question and answer period, a neuron can maintain persistent activity and even maintain persistent activity at multiple levels. And notice this is an integral, it's an integral of a pulse to a step. And I should say, I'm going to talk about uh, 
the eye movement system and brainstem circuitry in fish, but this was actually from a uh, paper in primates, primate uh, working memory systems by Christian Mockins and Carlos Brody. So the question is very, uh, very broad, and we think these types of circuits, you know, at least in motif form come up throughout multiple brain systems. Okay, so again, to review, the key idea is positive feedback through recurrent excitation or through recurrent disinhibition, a double negative form of positive feedback. All right, so what I'm gonna show you today is a, is a neural integrator of the eye movement system of many, of really any vertebrate animal. I'll be showing you at first the gold data from the goldfish eye movement system from Emory Oxi when he was in David Tank's lab. And then in the second half of the talk, more recent work from the zebrafish eye movement system. The behavior is shown here. It's horizontal eye movements. You see that the eyes are being maintained at a steady location and then make rap and then the eyes make rapid saccades or changes of eye direction. And we'll see data corresponding to this. So there's a fix eye fixation, saccade, 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 saccade. And I'm going to just tell you that all the data I'm going to be showing you is going to be from in the dark, so there's no visual feedback to stabilize the eye movements. Oops. Okay, so here is a mix of a cartoon and real data. So this is actually a real recording of eye position in the fish. And it, you should see exactly what you, in as a function of time, what you saw in the movie, the eyes are at a given position, a saccade, they maintain another position, a saccade occurs, another position, and so on as the eyes move back and forth. Um, I'm not showing you, and it's just a cartoon, that there are eye velocity coding command neurons that are either excitatory or inhibitory and move the eyes one way or the other, but notice they are transient. They move the eyes temporarily by providing a command, but then the command is off and the eye position is maintained. That maintenance of the eye position is due to maintaining persistently firing rates in a population of neurons known as the oculomotor neural integrator because it integrates eye velocity coding commands to neurons whose persistent firing rate is proportional to eye position. So like navigation, this is a velocity to position integration. And the persistent activity here is storing the running total of the input commands. That is the mathematical integral. Again, a brief, this is just a pulse to step integration repeated. Transient input leads to a step in firing rate. Another excitatory input comes in and there's another step in firing rate. You also see the direct effect of the external input. I'm gonna be focusing only on the persistent periods here um, and not on the brief transients that you see, which are a signature of the excitatory burst of input coming in. Okay, so the question is what circuitry controls this integration in this well-defined system where there's actually a devoted nucleus computing this integral. And instead of showing you actually firing rate traces for the first half of the talk, I'm just going to be focusing on steady states defined by a tuning curve. So each of the dots here was from the fish and it was during one fixation what the firing rate was as a, at a given eye position. And this is showing one neuron, but really the system has, in this case of order 100 neurons. What I was showing you was a neuron on the right side of the brain, whereas the eyes move to different fixations from left to right, the firing rates increase monotonically and quite linearly after, after a threshold. There's also neurons on the left side which decrease their firing rates uh, approximately threshold linearly as the eyes move from left to right. Here I have literally just done a mirror image of, of a combined set of neurons. So really some of these neurons were right side and some are flipped, in, uh, mirror flipped left side neurons. What I want to focus on here is that there are four populations, we believe, from anatomy and physiology in this circuit, uh, divided on either side of the midline of the brain. Uh, in blue are the inhibitory populations, and those project across the midline. In red are excitatory populations, those project within the same side of the brain. And this has the core architecture that I showed for you in the Mockins and Brody uh, science paper. We see that there is recurrent excitation which could maintain um, persistent activity and do the integration. And there's recurrent disinhibition, 
between the two sides. So any, any loop around the circuit from a cell to itself either goes through excitatory connections or through two inhibitory connections. So it's a positive feedback motif. And I'm not going to get into it today, but we believe that actually the inhibition is for coordinating the circuit and actually uh, each half of this integrator can actually do the, do the integral itself just with recurrent excitation. Um, so the second half of the talk, I'll only focus on data from one side of the integrator, which we believe maintains integration on its own from, from experiments and theory analysis, not today. Okay. So what I wanted to step back to uh, more theoretically is the picture of this in terms of dynamical systems. And it's a line attractor picture. So if we plot neurons firing rates, here's the firing rates of two neurons, F1 and F2 is a function of I position. They're both linear in I position. So if we plot them against each other, firing rate of neuron two versus firing rate of neuron one, we define a trajectory here which you can think of as the um, fixed points of the system. And it's a line attractor because every point along this is a fixed point. And actually what I'm gonna show you is actually a movie, Marvin the Martian is the goldfish's eyes and, you're, and red is actually the state of the system. And you'll hear the crackling of the action potentials from uh, one of these cells as the eyes move back and forth. And you'll see really that this is an attractor, a line attractor, a continuous attractor. You get a sense from the noise in the system as it diffuses a little bit along the attractor. And that was a saccade. During the saccade, it goes away from the attractor, but it's attracted back to this pat attractor pattern of firing rates. There's again a saccade, as you see it, leave the attractor and get attracted back. And again, you can see that it's integrating external inputs that are controlling the eyes moving back and forth, if you look at Marvin's eyes. Okay, so the picture here geometrically is that this system creates a line attractor in the space of firing rates. And the attractor really encodes the eye position. So one end of the attractor would be I position equal, for example, minus 20 degrees, and the other end would be plus 20 degrees. And what a saccade does is moves the system from one point on the attractor to another point in the attractor. So in the punchline here is that I position is represented by location along a low dimensional manifold. And that low dimensional manifold is a line attractor or a line of fixed points. Okay, so the question for the next portion of the talk is, can we build a model of this neural integrator and sort of a real biophysical model of a genuine integrator. And that's what we did. We set out, we built, there's a, about 150 neurons per side, we think. We are not positive, but we assume they're about equally di distributed between excitatory in red and inhibitory in blue populations. So we made four populations of 25 neurons. And we built a, uh, you know, a, simple, a simple model. Um, I'm going to show you the rate version of it. We actually built a full um, Hodgkin-Huxley conductance based model, but the principles are clearer with the firing rate model, and we built both. So the key thing is we're, of course, like any, like, like, like all of us, we're building a model of firing rate changes. There's intrinsic uh, decay in these neurons that needs to be offset to, by, by synaptic inputs to maintain firing. There's same side excitation, WIJ is the weight matrix. Excitation is ipsilateral, same side. There's also inhibition. Uh, we assume that's a weighted sum of inhibitory inputs. We put a nonlinearity on the form of the synaptic inputs. There's also a constant ton tonic background in this system, which actually comes from vestibular inputs that I'll talk about a little bit in the second half of the talk. And then those saccadic commands are B sub I, the burst commands. But we're gonna focus here on the persistent activity in the absence of the burst command. And for persistent activity, holding on to a running total of the input commands, these terms must all sum to zero. 
If these all sum to zero though, the derivative of the firing rate is proportional to the burst command and therefore the rate is proportional to the integral of the burst command. And that's where we think an integrator comes from, fundamentally from the synaptic inputs exa exactly, and there's questions of how exact, but at least approximately and quite tightly canceling the intrinsic leak in these neurons. And when that occurs, one gets an integrator. So this immediately says that how we can fit a network can integrate because we have this condition that the sum of these terms must equal zero. So that's exactly what we did. This is the fitting condition for each neuron I. It's a self-consistent condition. So on the left is the current needed to maintain the firing rate R. And what we're saying is that that current needed to maintain a given firing rate R sub I must equal the total excitatory current received plus the, or minus the total inhibitory current received plus the background input. And this defines you know, a fitting equation, a really a current-based decomposition on how we fit the network. So the knowns in this, because we have, rec we have samples in the, of recordings of firing rates throughout the circuit, and we actually, in this case, just put together individual neurons recorded on different trials and compiled from different animals. Um, we have knowledge from intracellular current experiments of what the intrinsic response F of R is in response to current injection. So we have an idea of how much current is needed to produce a given rate. But what we don't know, like in most systems, is what the synaptic weights, WIJ, are, the external weights, TI, or what the nonlinearities are. And we and what we did is we're going to just assume different forms of the nonlinearity. So we're going to pretend those S's are fixed. And if those S's are fixed, then we have, and we just combine these two excitatory inhibitory WIJs into a single overall, could be positive or negative WIJ, then we get an equation of this form. And you should recognize immediately that if we know the rates and we know S, we or we assume S the nonlinearity, then one gets just a simple regression equation. Yi equals sum of Wij xj, where this xj is the s of r's plus ti. And, it's, and that immediately says that we can very simply fit these. We aren't using recurrent backprop. We aren't using forced learning. Just it's a very simple, it's still doing the same thing in terms of the, we're really using a cost function and we added, and we can add regularizations to it. We can actually add perturbation experiments where the rates come during a perturbate, following a perturbation, but it's really a least squares problem on yi minus the sum wij xj plus ti. And the methods are in this paper by Dimitri Fisher from 2013. And furthermore, you can extend it, and it's in the supplement of the Fisher paper, to general time-varying problems, not just persistent activity, where we add tau drdt. If we assume tau, then drdt is just a fixed known number. OK, so that's the methods. And I just want to show you that it, that it actually works. And we actually could extend it to uh, actually doing this in voltage and actually produce a spiking model. And that's shown at the top here. So here you see a, the psychotic inputs coming in in black in the model. And here's the voltage. And you can see there's a brief uh, you know, burst uh, in the voltage of an integrator neuron at the time it receives the psychotic input. But what I want you to focus on is during the fixations. So initially, this neuron was silent. It received a burst input. It starts firing at a tonic rate. Um, it receives another burst input, and it starts firing at a higher tonic rate. It's mathematically integrating. So what I'm showing you here is another neuron. It doesn't have the overshoots uh, in firing rate, but it's another neuron in the network that didn't directly receive the psychotic input. And what's shown here is its firing rate as a function of time. The green trace is a perfect integral just to guide your eye. Um, the gray is the raw firing rate, and the black is a slightly smooth firing rate like you'd see in an experimental paper. And you can see it's really forming a perfect integral. So that's for one neuron. And if we look at all neurons, we actually just took neurons from, again, an experimental database. The lines are the tuning curves I showed you earlier from the experimental database. And the boxes are actually in the model what the firing rates were. And we also tried to match some noise statistics. So that's what the, box, what the boxes are showing is just the, the noise. And these are quite regular firing neurons, uh, unlike the more Poisson-like uh, you know, neocortical ones. So again, you know, this I think was sort of a landmark of really building a recurrent circuit that could fit 
you know, every neuron from a compiled database representing this circuit. And we could really say, you know, this neuron with this threshold in the model corresponds to that neuron, you know, with that threshold in the real animal. Um, but, and there were many conclusions we could draw about how the circuit is organized, um, but we had to be really careful. And I wanna, in the next portion of the talk, just to say, where, where does this process and where does this process for all of us in you know, theoretical and computational neuroscience potentially go horribly awry? And where it goes horribly awry is we're fitting a network which has of order n squared potential weights. And even if it's sparse, it's still a huge number of weights for any reasonable sized network. Um, in this network, it's um, half of 10,000 weights. So there's 5,000 weights. And that means when we have a model cost function surface, like we're minimizing, there's going to be certain combinations of weights that we can change and the fit's not going to change. And then there's other directions where we can change, where we change those combinations of weights and then the cost function changes a lot. And those are really what we learned something about. So, but how do we identify those? Well, part of the formulation of this problem as a regression problem was so that we would have a nice cost function surface, surface where we could very easily calculate the Hessian, the second derivative of the cost function with respect to you know, different pairs of weights. And then we can calculate the principal components of this, Hessian, of this Hessian matrix to identify the pattern of weight changes to which the system is most sensitive. And when we did this, what we learned was that there were that the model fits really depended only on four most sensitive components. That's really what we learned from this model, that there were four numbers, four combinations of weights that were really well constrained by the data we put into the model. And the other ones is just this continuum really weren't well constrained. They were sloppy in the language of you know, some classic work in, in physics and or just degenerate in the sense of um, in the sense of you know, statistical fits. What were these four components? I'm not going to show them here, but the leading two are things you'd expect. The leading component just says if we make all of the weights either more excitatory or less inhibitory, the model fails horribly. The next one relates to the balance of excitation and inhibition, which you can think of as a net positive feedback one. So you, you know, if you change something about the overall amount of excitation minus inhibition in the in the this sort of sum total average, then the model fails miserably. The next two are a little bit more system specific about exactly what the thresholds of different neurons are. But this now leaves, you know, and this now leaves us with quite a quandary and quite a quandary, I think, for the field. And I want to show you just a real highlight of the type of issues that you can get in. So this is two different circuits with different connectivity. Um, they're in blocks. So again, there were 100 neurons in blocks of left side and right side excitatory or inhibitory. So this upper left would be a, um, you know, I can't remember how I organized it, but maybe like the right side, red is excitatory. So right side excitatory to excitatory recurrent connectivity. And in this fit, that was nearly uniform for the excitatory to excitatory connectivity. However, look at this fit right here. This one's very local. You know, so it, you can see it's nearly, you know, it's mostly along the diagonal. Now, these are two extremely different network architectures. But if you actually look at the firing rate versus time, this is showing the average, but you can actually even look neuron by neuron. You know, I, I dare you in a psychophysics uh, experiment to tell me the difference between these two left and right, you know, these two left and right plots. And, and again, the, the fluorescent colors are just to guide you to sort of guide your eye of perfect integrals. And then the, uh, the black and gray traces are the actual firing rates, but you can see every nook and cranny are the same. So how do we think about this? Well, the way we think about this is what if we take a, the difference between these two matrices, literally subtract it and calculate the difference and then project that difference along the principal components of the Hessian, along the sensitive and insensitive eigenvectors. Well, we did that. And what you find is that, remember, there were only four well-defined, you know, non-sloppy eigenvectors here. And these four, and the difference between these two networks when projected along the different eigenvectors is X, this is, a, I should say, this is in log units, are exponentially small differences between them. So effectively, these two networks, even though they look extremely different, 
in terms of just the raw entries of the weight matrix are effectively identical in terms of those four leading components that needed to be fit to fit the data. And all the differences you're seeing are from sloppy components that don't change the overall firing rate output. And I think this is a real lesson of saying, what do we learn? Well, what we learned is about these four leading components. And what we didn't learn is about all the other components. And I think when we go to interpret model fits that we'll see, we see a lot of where people put in data and fit it either a deep network or any other network um, to these models, um, you got to really think about what you did learn and what sloppiness there is and what you didn't learn. And, you know, regularization is a wonderful thing, but, you know, we really better trust our regularizations because this says that, that we're, we're really selecting a particular answer with our regularization. Okay, so I'm just going to now talk about a you know, some more recent work unpublished on a perturbation strategy for breaking these degeneracies. And this is now done in the zebrafish where uh, we can, you know, where Emre Oxai, my collaborator, can, you know, observe many cells all at once and also do perturbations. So that's what he does. He record, he's monitoring eye position. Every time the animal makes a saccade, the zebrafish make fairly stereotypical eye movements. So I'm only gonna show you averages across eye movements, but animal makes a saccade. And this is the recording starting one second after the saccade of, a whole population of simultaneously recorded neurons. Um, you can see there's some that are more persistent, some that decay a little bit faster. And then he's also going to apply perturbations and look at the firing rates after perturbations. And the idea here is if we're going to try to break degeneracies, we can place the system in different, the, basically place the state of the system at different initial conditions within the dynamical landscape and maybe sort of map out the attractor surface not just at the fixed points, but throughout. So that's what he does. From these, from these fits, we're going to try to infer the weight matrix as best we can, and hopefully at least reduce degeneracies. And then once we have this weight matrix to test how well things work, we're going to try to predict novel perturbations that were held out. So what we did is we, we did this in simulated data. And if you make a perfect network with no noise, and perfect measurements. You can see here, this is a covariance of the fit matrix and the true matrix, and it's basically perfect. It's actually 98, it's not quite perfect. With 10 perturbations, you get 90% overlap. So here was the true weight matrix, here's the fit with 10 perturbations, and they're almost identical. And I'm just gonna also show you, this is gonna be a mystery here. Now look at this fit with one perturbation. It does not do very well at getting the true underlying weight matrix. So that's with one, but I now want you to keep your eye on this n equals one perturbation as I add a new plot and say, okay, this is not of the right weight matrix, but now I'm gonna plot not how well it fit the weight matrix, but how well it fit the neural data. So now this red line is how well it predicted a novel perturbation, not data that it was fit to, not training data, but a novel test data. And even with one perturbation, the network can actually predict novel perturbations. And this is averaged over many trials. This is an example, the observed firing rate following a novel perturbation and the prediction from this fit that only had one perturbation that didn't get the weight matrix right. And the question is what's going on here? And I now want to show you what, we, what is going on, what saw, where does this mystery come from? Because it's important for the rest of the story. So here's the true weight matrix that I showed you that it couldn't fit properly. But we can break that true weight matrix into two, into components. We can look and we just, in this case, linearized, and we can look and we get, you can make a matrix, we can basically find the eigenvectors of the linearized system and calculate the true weight matrix using only the long time scale eigenmodes. And then the, and then, the true W from the short time scale eigenmode. So we're just breaking this weight matrix into its, into its eigenmode components with the leading long time scale eigenmodes that correspond to the persistent activity in the short ones. And it turns out what that one perturbation network's doing is it's doing a great job. It's almost perfectly getting the W long, but it's failing to get W short. And what this means is for most of our fits, we actually, um, are fitting almost, most of the fit is actually 
well after the time of the perturbation. So most of our data, notice the data is going out to five seconds. Those short modes are where we're making errors, but they're really brief and they're in here. And the long modes we're getting completely right. And that's why we can even predict novel perturbations if we don't look at the first little bit of time after the stimulation. Okay, so this is already giving a hint of what you might be able to get better and worse from, from using even a small number of perturbations. Maybe what we really can learn about is the long mode portion of the weight matrix as opposed to the actual weight matrix. So now let's go to real experiments. Real experiments aren't gonna work so well. And they're not gonna work, but they're gonna not, but we are gonna be able to learn some things. So here's a real network. And here's the two big problems. Number one, in any real network, we're not looking, we're not recording even a remote fraction of the network, even in the zebrafish, we don't, you know, record all of the neurons. We only observe, you know, some of them in any given trial, you know, in any given trial. For example, maybe if there's a sheet, uh, a light sheet, and you're only getting one plane. And more generally, we're in this case, not even going to try to use data where we recorded everything just to make Other problem is the measurements of calcium fluorescent fused are not equal to neural firing rate. Um, calcium is a low pass filtered signal. Um, it's not just the indicator, it's just calcium itself is slow to respond. Um, there's measurement noise as well as intrinsic noise, and the sampling rates are quite low. So now we have imperfect assessment of neural firing rate. And when you combine those together, we didn't we couldn't actually perfectly fit the network, but I want to show you what we could and couldn't fit. And we're first going to look at simulations just to get intuitions. And we're going to put these factors into the simulations. So this is actually showing that perturbations will reveal the long time scale eigen modes. So dashed line is ground truth, the eigen values in the network. And even with 10 perturbations, we can actually do a good job of fitting the first almost 10 eigenvalues, if we don't use perturbations, we're only getting the first eigenvalue. We're just getting one mode. Um, for eigenvectors, I'll tell you it's more like the first four we can get. And again, what we did from the eigenvectors is we put together the effective weight matrix from the neurons that were observed and their components in the eigenvectors. And with 10 perturbations, we can do a very good job with a 73% uh, you know, um, correlation to the true matrix, whereas without perturbations, we do a horrible job of even getting this effective long time scale matrix. The second thing is prediction. Once we infer a matrix, can we predict novel perturbations? And the answer is quite well. So if we don't use perturbation data, if we, do, if we just do recordings without perturbations, the dashed line here is, a nov is the response to a novel perturbation. And the prediction from the model, I'm showing you a particularly bad one, but in general, it's pretty bad, is totally off. But if we fit with 10 perturbations, we, you know, in general, and I can show you the average fits are very good. We can quite well predict a novel perturbation. So now the final question is, what about the data? Well, in data, we only have two perturbations in the data set, so we're not going to do quite as well. But we can infer a long mode effective matrix. And it looks like it's got some local connectivity. And here, this is local in terms of the time constant. That is, nearby time constants tend to fit each other. I will say, without perturbations, that didn't have to be the case. And we've done controls. And this seems to be uh, robust. This seems to be a sensitive direction of the cost function. Um, if we don't use perturbations, we do not do a good job of predicting a novel perturbation. That's shown here. The real, the novel perturbation response is in dashed in blue. The prediction is in red, but even with just two perturbations, we can do a good job of predicting the response to novel perturbations. And we think that's because we're really starting to get at the key matrix structure underlying the long time scale modes. And since this is a model system for studying persistent activity, though that's actually the part of the weight matrix we're interested in, the part that really controls the persistent activity in the long time scale integration. So I will leave it there, and I would like to um, just do a fine uh, integration now, not in short term or working memory in neural integration, that type, that type of neural integration, but in long term memory. 
And this is work in collaboration with Jennifer Raymond uh, at Stanford and a shared student of ours, Jay Bassine, now a postdoc, who's now finishing up his work as a postdoc in my lab. So the problem we're gonna be looking at is a problem of what's called systems consolidation of long-term memories. So throughout multiple systems of the brain, we have an early learning area. The most classic one is the hippocampus, where learning is thought to occur, for example, within a few trials. And then over time, and that, can, that time can be 30 days or it can be hours, the learning learned in the early learning area is transferred or consolidated into, a sep, into an anatomically separate late learning area. So hippocampal uh, memories are thought to be consolidated, at least in part, in the neocortex. Um, in the bird song, there's beautiful evidence that striatal form memories are, are consolidated into motor cortex. Um, same things occur for amygdala and for cerebellum, and I'm going to talk about the cerebellum. Okay, and I'm going to again use the beauty of the simplicity of the circuit, the relative simplicity of the oculomotor system to get at this question. And what we're going to be looking at is the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Which is, an, which is another gaze stabilization mechanism shown here. So this is supposed to be a monkey fixating on a banana. And you can see as its head turns, and we all have this reflex ourselves, um, the eyes counter rotate to stabilize gaze on this image. So what the input in here, here is, is not a psychotic input, but a head velocity or vestibular input moving sinusoidally. And the motor output is eye velocity as the eyes counter rotate. And the quantity I'll be plotting is the gain of this reflex, which is the eye movement amplitude relative to the head movement input amplitude. Now, the important thing here and why I'm talking about learning and long-term memory is that you can train the gain to change. So this is called gain up training. It trains an animal to increase the amplitude of its VOR. And what you see is now the banana is moving opposite to the head. So the animal needs to counter rotate its eyes more. And if you do this, now if you repeat this and then you turn the lights off and test the eye velocity output in the dark, whereas what I'm showing here was the original sinusoidal eye velocity output, the new eye velocity output will increase. The gain will increase. It'll make the animal will have learned even in the dark without a stimulus to follow, can make a bigger eye movement in response to the head. And then the question is, where are the synaptic changes underlying this learning? And that's the long-term memory. So just a brief VOR circuit model. So now we have an input, it's head rotation or head velocity. And that is a, a velocity command to the same neural integrator that I talked about. And it leads to an output eye rotation. But for learning, at least the early parts of learning, there's a side loop and it goes through the cerebellar cortex onto Purkinje neurons. And then and through that, and that these weights onto the Purkinje neurons, I would think are the early plasticity in the system. And then we think at later times, this plasticity will actually consolidate out to the direct pathway because you can lesion the cerebellar cortex after some amount of time on the order of a day um, and the memory will still be there or maybe, maybe several hours. So I'm not gonna show the integrator here because I'm just gonna focus really on the input output relationship and the gain of this relationship. And again, here's what's happening during training of the animal. The weight here, in order to increase the eye rotation, Purkinje cells are inhibitory. So you actually have to decrease this weight. This is the famous Mar Albus Ito model of parallel fiber, um, LTD, so the weights decrease, and that leads to an increase in the output eye rotation gain, and that's during a training period. Then you stop training, you turn off the training stimulus, and over time, the weights will go back to, or at least back towards, and we think potentially all the way to their pre-training levels. But in order to maintain the eye rotation, the weights had to go, the, there still needs to be weight changes, and we think they're consolidated in this direct pathway weight V, and that enables at least some amount of the initial learning to be maintained. And I want to note again that this is an analog operation because the animal should be able to learn any of an analog level of gain changes. Okay, so the question is, how is this done? And what 
candidate learning rules are there from transferring initial learning at this weight W onto the Purkinje cells to this late weight V onto the brainstem neurons. These are the medial vestibular nucleus neurons for the aficionados. And there's two natural candidates. One is heavy in plasticity. And then the idea would be the Purkinje cells fire, they change the voltage of this cell and the correlation of that with the MOS, with this, it's called the mossy fiber input, the input coming to this synaptic weight of value V, that correlation drives learning. The other possibility would be heterosynaptic plasticity where it's the correlation between the Purkinje cell cerebellar input and the mossy fiber direct brainstem input that drives plasticity of this red weight V. So let's first look at pure heavy and plasticity. So now DVDT is proportional just to pre times post. Pre is mossy fiber, post is the medial vestibular nucleus neuron. This is standard stuff. We're gonna now keep track of the change in weights and it's just the change in really this weight, um, this change in this weight V and the change in eye movements. And um, <clears throat> again, there's initial learning at W that goes away. And what happens? Oh, the late learning weight goes unstable. But this shouldn't surprise us. We all know that heavy in plasticity, I hope, is unstable. Whenever you have you know, learning, if the weight V gets larger, then you're gonna be driving more postsynaptic firing, which means you're gonna send a larger learning um, signal and that's gonna blow, and that's gonna end up being unstable and blowing it up. So what's the standard thing? We're gonna do the standard thing. You don't use pure heavy in correlational rules. You use a, a heavy in covariance rule where instead of plotting postsynaptic activity, you plot postsynaptic activity relative to a threshold, where this threshold is an average, sort of an average over some time scale, over some reasonably long time scale of the activity of the MVM neuron. And if you do that, well, then everything seems to work. You get a nice transfer of the weight from early learning at W to late changes in V. And however, and this has been published, however, there's a real problem. And that's where I'm going here. So now, now wake up if you thought that you knew what was gonna happen because this is with no input post-training. But if there's actually time varying input during the post-training period or even noise coming along, the coming along the mossy fibers, then it still blows up. So it looks, there are ways we're looking at which might fix this with more slightly exotic um, or slightly different heavy and rules, but this, this really says the standard heavy and rules don't work or if they, in, or they'll lead to just sort of binary outputs on this, on this synapse. So now let's look at heterosynaptic plasticity. Heterosynaptic plasticity, again, changes in V are proportional to the correlation between mossy fiber and Purkinje cells the two different presynaptic input one and presynaptic input two. We then do it, and we're gonna subtract off again, a baseline of the Purkinje cells. There's an averaging, there's an averaging over time. And then we do the same thing. We look at the change in weights and the change in eye movements. And here again, with no input post-training, early learning occurs in the cerebellar cortical weight W. It transfers to the brainstem weight V, all looks good and all continues to be good, even if there's activity or noise post-training. So the heterosynaptic rule is stable and, it, and it's because it avoids the correlation of the mossy fibers driving, driving the MVN activity and the fluctuations in the mossy fibers driving the fluctuations in the, in the MVN neurons. So I should say, why did the, other, why did the heavy end rule fail? Well, because what we subtracted off was a mean, and that took care of the mean activity of the postsynaptic neuron, but it didn't take care of the fluctuations. And if you do the math, you get a fluctuation, you get that DVDT is proportional to the fluctuations squared. And that's a positive, and that's positive. Okay, so how do we view this? And I wanna now view this in the phase plane. So we're gonna plot V and W, and we're gonna plot how the weights change over time. So what we said is early in the training period, it's almost completely a change in the weight W, that's the horizontal axis and it's LPD. And then that transfers and starts transferring to the weight V. And you can see W is going back to zero, it goes up, V is starting to inherit to receive that weight 
and there's the trajectory in the phase plane. And in fact, during the post-training period, we can analytically um, approximately calculate the full vector field. So that's showing the gray arrows. And what you'll notice is that where they're pointing, they're going, they form a line attractor in this space. So we can see that the weights are getting attracted to a line attractor. And if we do three days of uh, simulate three days of training, you can now see there's training and then no, and then a post-training period, training again, a post-training period. And you can see V consolidates from the first training period, then it reaches a steady state. It there's a new training period, it consolidates that, it consolidates that. In the phase plane, you can see this line attractor at work now. You know, initially the training changes the early learning weight, and then it relaxes to the line attractor. And it does that over and over again. So this leads to a fundamental computational principle that systems consolidation of graded memories corresponds to movement to a new position along a line attractor in synaptic weight space. And I want to say that this now really makes a link, a conceptual link between short-term and long-term memory. So in long-term memory, I just showed you there's a line attractor in the space of synaptic weights W and V. Well, that looks just like the first half of the story where I showed you in the short-term neural integrator, we had firing rates and we had a line attractor in firing rate space. So really this says, yes, they're different and they're different in detail and exactly what they're doing. But if we think of them geometrically in the language of attractors, this really says that systems consolidation of long-term memory is integration obeying attractor dynamics in weight space, just as integration and working memory of analog quantities is integration in firing rate space. And the final slot thing that I'd like to show you is just, well, why does that help? You know, what insights does that start giving you? And, and actually there's like, the very, all, one I'm not gonna show you is there's a fine tuning condition, which, you know, we sort of knew to look for because of this same analogy. But, you know, when we talk about um, attractors, we think of diffusion along the basin. That's a core property of a line attractor is diffusion. And we get the end, we get the same type of phenomenon here. We get really a speed accuracy trade-off almost in the language of decision decision making systems. And, and what I let me tell you what I mean by that. Well, if we look at our vector field here, if we look at the slopes of the arrows in the vector field, dv dw are given by the learning, are given you can calculate by the learning rate of V relative to the learning rate of W. So if V is learning slowly, these will be very shallow slopes. And that means your initial learning will only lead to a little bit of consolidation. So consolidation would be slow in this system and take many, many days. On the other hand, if the learning rate of V is faster, you get more consolidation. Just one learning period, you almost consolidate completely what you learned. The dashed line would be as if you consolidated everything that was learned in the early period. So that says, you know, larger slopes, faster learning rate at V, more consolidation, more speed of consolidation. But there's a trade-off here. And the trade-off is suppose that there's, you know, there's naturally going to be lots of noise coming in and lots of sort of noisy learning events in the weight W. This is sort of random coincidences of spontaneous activity along the, the pathways that lead to that learning. And that means you're going to get noise accumulation. So if you consolidate a lot, you're going to consolidate all of this noisy activity. And you're going to get a lot, a random walk, a diffusion of your downstream weight. But if you consolidate more slowly, you're going to have less noise accumulation. So here is the trade-off of a robustness to noise versus a speed of consolidation. So it's sort of a speed accuracy trade-off. And I'm going to leave it there and just summarize. So to summarize, we talked here about neural integrators, both in firing rates and in, and in synaptic weights. And neural integrators accumulate and store a running total of their inputs. In short-term memory, this was governed by integration along a line attractor in neural activity space. And I showed a perturbation based strategy that reveals the effective weight matrix governing the slow time scale dynamics. In long term memory, in particular systems consolidation, it was governed by integration along a line, attra a line attractor in synaptic weight space. And here I showed that heterosynaptic learning readily forms such attractors. And I'll leave it there by just uh, thanking you know, the many people in my lab, and in particular, this work 
Uh, the first half of the story was heavily from Itzazo Olasagasti and Dimitri Fisher, the second half of the, and Alex Sood, who I should have put in bold, and the second half of the story from Jay Basin, and, thank, and a thanks to the experimental collaborators on this, uh, on this story as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs>